So welcome for this semester full of online free learning with the Slow Factory Foundation under Open EDU, an, an initiative that we are running with the, with the team, with a bunch of partners. And for this first chapter, the first chapter is called From Food to Fashion, and we are going to look at several case studies. The food industry is an industry that's way ahead of the fashion industry in terms of uh, sustainability practices, um, mainly because the public is very much aware of the things that they put inside their bodies. And so it's an industry that had to innovate very, very uh, early on. Uh, in fact, since the 80s and 90s, the organic food movement has have been you know, pushing the boundaries to enter the, the, the mainstream, if you will. And I think now you know, everyone knows what organic food means and what you should be eating and how you should be feeding your body. And of course, when we talk about organic food and, and access to organic food, we have to talk about food security. Uh, this class, though, is going to focus on the best practices that we found in uh, olive oil and olive oil that's harvested in the United States. We're also going to look at the origin of olive oil, regenerative agriculture. We also have two guest speakers. I'm so excited to, uh, to be sharing this moment with you all. Thank you all for coming. So origin of the olive oil. And with that, we have to talk about colonialism and how the olive oil arrived into this part of the world. So before we start, how many of you have olive oil in their pantry? Okay, so so far we have 125, 120 yeses. Great. So we'll, we'll, we'll pretend that at least half of you have olive oil in your pantry. So olive oil has always been considered the green gold, if you will, throughout time. So this is like a, an illustration of uh, Rome, the Roman Empire invading our part of the world, which looks like the Levant or at least Lebanon or Palestine, which have the most uh, olive trees uh, in the world. And with this map, we're going to look a little bit about how th this tree land in America and where does it come from? What are the best practices around it? And how is it related to, to wellness, to spirituality and so on? But also we're going to look at regenerative agriculture and best practices that can be uh, adopted into the fashion industry. So the origin of the olive oil is very closely tied to colonialism, whether they, you know, the Europeans uh, invaded the land of the Middle East, as we call it, it's a problematic term. Uh, the Levant is also a problematic term. So I'm just going to use the countries that were also colonial because before the last colonial empire, this land was basically like one land. Palestine, Lebanon uh, are considered to be the countries that uh, where olive oil generated from, and it happens to be where we come from. So it's really cool to share this part of our history with you all. And now even with some very advanced gene mapping and DNA, we're trying to find where is the actual first origin of the olive oil, because it's a tree that has traveled a lot with the uh, also invasion and the um, theft of the Christian religion that comes also from that same land and the relationship between olive oil and vines and how they grow together. And that's basically the, the basis of regenerative agriculture. So California, okay, we're talking about olive oil that's grown in California. The Franciscans who were, of course, Europeans that had adopted the Christian religion by uh, several invasions in the region of the Middle East that are now known as the Middle East. But prior to that, it was the region that encompasses Palestine and Lebanon and where the olive trees grow, as I mentioned, and where the Christian religion originated from, which was not a religion. It was a sort of a cult, if you will, around a man who was talking about, you know, revolutionary things and eventually um, that grew into a religion and uh, for 300 years the people who believed in that way of thinking were persecuted and uh, and culturally cleansed but eventually europeans came back and thought you know what this religion talks about love it talks about if someone slaps you turn the other cheek it's a very good um philosophy for us for our conquest so let's adopt it so 
here we are. This is a very quick like background on the Franciscans. And then uh, they took the olive oil and marched and, and came to, the, to colonize North America. They marched north, establishing missions in California. They also planted olive groves. S Southern California saw the first olive tree. Now, why California? Because the climate is very similar to the Middle Eastern climate, to the Mediterranean climate. Um, and it's, it's, it's very fascinating how California, so far of the Mediterranean, has the same kind of climate properties. So the olive tree could grow very well there. So according to an account in Judith Taylor's book, The Olive in California, a visitor to the mission San Fernando in 1842 saw the mission buildings in ruins, but the orchard with a good crop of olives. The visitor remarked that the mission probably had the biggest olive trees in the state. And that's how since uh, the 1800s, early 1800s, America had their first olive trees. And just like the grape, the Christian missionaries brought the olive tree with them to California for food, but also for ceremonial use and for the expansion of their empire and the expansion of their um, control of the land. And that falls under the definition of environmental colonialism or what we call green colonialism. After this class, you guys will receive all of the re references that I use for this class, including the amazing podcast by Naomi Klein called Let Them Drown. I don't know if some of you have listened to this podcast, but it's a podcast. I, the first time I listened to it, I cried so much because she bases her anti-colonial uh, rhetoric, if you will, or post-colonialism on uh, Edward Said, who is a Palestinian scholar and uh, his wife was in the audience as she tells the, as she talks about it, as she does her lecture, let them drown. So in it, she talks about environmental colonialism. And of course she references North America and the land theft from indigenous people here in North America, but creates a sort of um, parallel with Palestinian, the Palestinian struggle and the land theft in Palestine. And the way that foreign trees were planted, similarly to the olive tree could be considered an, a foreign tree here in North America, in Palestine and in the south of Lebanon, uh, some of the land theft and the foreign trees that were introduced were European trees. And some villages, as she talks about, uh, were being completely erased and planted over. And so many campaigns that are around ecology and planting trees are in fact problematic because they are based on the theft of indigenous land and the control of that land through the rhetoric of ecology. So it's a beautiful, a powerful, important body of work. Of course, Naomi Klein is incredible, but the Let Them Drown uh, lecture in particular, uh, we found very interesting here at Slow Factory and we wanted to share it with you and I'm just gonna read her quote. There is a long and painful history in the Americas of beautiful pieces of wilderness being turned into conservation parks. And then that designation being used to prevent indigenous people from accessing their ancestral territories to hunt and fish or to simply live. And the same can be found in Palestine since we are talking about the olive tree and about history. Next chapter is the agricultural history around, uh, around the olive oil, of course. And we're gonna look at designing agriculture. Now, this for us is very interesting because as we were looking deeper and deeper into the origin of the olive oil and the olive tree and the way that agriculture was designed around the vines, around the olives and them coexisting together, we found that most of the ancient knowledge that belonged to this part of the world, Palestine and Lebanon, was drawn on pottery or was drawn on walls. It was an oral tradition. It was very hard for us to find things that were written. So I encourage, if any of you find this interesting, I would encourage you to do a master's or a PhD in the region because we definitely need to document this part of the world because it wasn't properly documented and erased again and again under colonial uh, powers. So it was very hard to find information, but we do know from oral history 
that our peoples engaged in regenerative agriculture. Um, and so we, we, we create parallels with indigenous knowledge because that's where it is the most documented and uh, the body of work is, is very important with indigenous cultures. Here we are, we can classify the conservation and rehabilitation approach to food and farming system as regenerative agriculture. And there is a link between regenerative agriculture from food to fashion, and the best practices can be applied in both industries. Prioritizing topsoil regeneration, increasing biodiversity, improving the water cycle, enhancing ecosystem services, supporting biosequestration, strengthening the health of farm soil and increasing resilience to climate change, recycling as much farm waste as possible and adding composted material from sources outside the farm is one of the ways in which we can practice regenerative agriculture. Now, regenerative agriculture is a body of knowledge in and of itself. And in these classes, we are just, you know, touching the tip of the iceberg. So if you are in fact interested in regenerative agriculture, the previous class that was given by Teju and in partnership with Fibershed will be available online very soon. And I encourage you guys to take it as well. So in biodiversity, it's the very simple concept of planting and diversifying the crops around the main crops that we are trying to exploit, I would like to say, but there are better ways, of course, to, to talking about that, to trying to harvest. So here we have the layers of the edible forest garden, which is a very simple example that's the most uh, uh, familiar in, in, in most of um, the books that we found about biodiversity in North America. But regenerative agriculture is indigenous wisdom. And with that, it's also a wisdom that is based on oral tradition. And indigenous agriculture practices are inherently regenerative as they are good for the earth and good for, of course, the people and the communities around them. One of the ancient practices under regenerative agriculture is agroforestry. And if you are interested in learning more about agroforestry, we really recommend you guys we will be including these links in the package that you will receive after this class. But again, you can for sure Google agroforestry and there are so many amazing information about that. So it benefits, the uh, benefits of agroforestry includes better pollination services, biodiversity of pollinators, improved soil health, lower water needs and better water quality, improved air quality, improved pest control, because the way that agroforestry, the philosophies is instead of using chemicals to remove the pests, uh, they in, introduce other types of uh, insects that will feed off of the insects that are more um, damaging for the crops. Multi-story canopy cover that provides varying levels of shade and sun for animals and plants and diversified farm enterprises that sell fruits, flowers and nuts and or woods. We had just recently participated in the Rainforest Alliance, Follow the Frog, and we did discuss this and we posted, uh, we are about to post, I believe, um, on social media, um, on the Slow Factory channel, something about regenerative economics. And the regenerative economics are basically uh, providing support on a diversity of, uh, from the diversity of crops, there's a diversity of economics that can exist. And that's where fashion fits in. This was done with Fiber Shed, one of our partners, uh, and explaining the soil restoration. And soil health is public health, uh, in a way, in a nutshell. Of course, this is like a big slogan, but this was coined by uh, soil scientist Bill Robertson. And there is a body of work that accompanies this type of uh, infographics that we launched uh, with Fiber Shed that we will be sending you guys after this class. But the foundation of our agricultural system is the soil. And without alarming anyone, there is less than 60 years left of topsoil on the planet for all agriculture, including the cotton. So that's why this series from food to fashion is very much linked to the health soil and the health benefit of soil into agriculture. And fashion is uh, an industry that impacts agriculture. And when we talk about agriculture, we talk also about carbon and resequestering carbon into the soil. Because right now what we are seeing is that carbon is all over our atmosphere. It shouldn't exist in that quantity 
in our atmospheres with the level of deforestation that exists onto this planet, we need to find solutions to take that carbon and bring it back into the soil in order to feed our soil. So let's look a little bit at environmental and health concerns together. On a scale from one to 10, how bad do you feel about climate? One being, uh, I don't care, and 10 <laughs> being, I'm freaking out. So from a scale to one to 10, I would love to ask you to participate in the chat and tell me how bad do you feel about climate change? And this is just to survey what we call the climate anxiety syndrome is basically, oh my God, everyone's like a hundred. <laughs> yes, we all are deeply impacted by this awareness about our climate and the way that climate is impacting everything. And it's also impacting the olive trees. In Italy, for example, the olive harvest has dropped 57% as a result of climate change. And that is because of a bacteria that eats up the trees and spreads like a virus all over the trees and really kind of like kills them. It kills really old trees, guys. It's like a very big problem. There's also soil erosion. It's with the fact that most of the massive industrial agricultural uh, projects are not engaging in regenerative agriculture. Now, I know you all know organic means no pesticides, but regeneration is key. We can't just talk about organic harvest. We have to talk about regenerative harvest. So soil erosion is probably the most serious environmental problem associated with olive uh, farming as distinct from olive processing, which is not covered by this study. But also olive processing is also very damaging to our environment, unless it's done in a clean, transparent and accountable way. And the carbon footprint of olive oil is similar to the carbon footprint associated with farming textile at scale for the fashion industry. So that's where there is a relationship between the way that we are farming across industries. So for olive oil produced in the Mediterranean, the production of fertilizers and pesticides, their transportation to the field and their use, the extraction and use of water for irrigation, the production, transportation and use of diesel fuel for all field activities, the collection of olives with various mechanical means, the transportation of olives to the olive oil mills, the production of olive oil at the olive oil mills, etc., etc. So most of it is done in unethical production. A 2010 study by UC Davis tested 19 popular olive oil brands sold in the US and found that nearly 70% of the bottles labeled extra virgin didn't meet parameters to be labeled as such. So there is, you know, we are now in the age of awareness and in the age of uprising and revolution and change. And there, it, you know, it's not a surprise if I tell you that most of the productions that we see for olive oils or for our clothing is done in a very corrupt system where there is a lot of opacity in the way that we cannot trace to the source, what is happening with our products. And, and that's what we should be demanding. So um, olive oil fraud <laughs> has been around for millennia with the earliest written mention of olive oil on cuneiform tablets in, at Elba in the 24th century BC, describing teams of inspectors who toured olive oil mills on behalf of the king looking for fraudulent practices. But with every issue, there are solutions. So that's where we want to build these classes around education, because yes, it's true. It's pretty grim out there. The information may give you some panic attacks and some um, climate anxiety, as we say, but we have to heal and go beyond that because with every issue, there are solutions. Let's look at them together. First of them is the project Drawdown. How many of you are familiar with the Project Drawdown? You can either raise your hand or use the chat. I would just love to know. The Project Drawdown archived over 100 climate positive solutions that are ready to implement like right now, right now. You can implement these solutions today. And some of them involve agriculture, 
Some of them involve education, but they are very um, holistic in their approach. They're not just looking at one sector. So I would very much encourage you guys to look at Project Drawdown either online or by buying the book. And online already you have like such an amazing body of work. And we reference often Project Drawdown because it's a pillar in our uh, movement in finding solutions that are applicable today, solutions that we need the public to rally behind immediately so that we are able to reach our climate positive goals uh, in time. So when we say there's like seven years left or 10 years left, it's before a complete climate collapse. So we have already entered the age of no return, okay? We can't change climate change. Climate change is inevitable. There isn't any of these solutions that is going to stop climate change. But what is going to happen is extend the period in which we can survive on this planet and provide us with solutions that are long-term going to minimize and address the climate change issues that are going to be hitting us globally. Okay, let's talk about regenerative networks. The principle, a regenerative material economy mimics the metabolic, the metabolic process found in resilient living systems. Basically, what that means is that res, uh, regenerative mimics nature, whereas there isn't anything in regeneration that looks at waste as simply waste. Waste is never wasted. It is always something that we can bring back and re-include into our systems as food. And likewise for the networks, it is a way to create a circular and regenerative way in sharing wealth, in sharing power. So when we are talking about equity, regenerative networks are a very powerful way in addressing it at scale. We're going to look at a good case study here with Brightland. And what you see here, these bottles are bottles we made with Brightland. We're so excited. And they're coming out on October 1st, but this is not an infomercial. However, 100% of these proceeds are going to support the open education uh, initiative that we've launched. So we're very grateful to being part of this uh, amazing project. Brightland uses California Arbiquina and California Arbosona, Arbosana olives. Uh, English is my third language, you have to believe it. And they both originated from Spain, uh, from Catalonia and Tarragona, and they are grown in a farm in California and harvested in a regenerative way, organic, transparent, and traceable. And it's basically a model that's from farm to bottle. It's a beautiful model that we would love to see scale with the fashion industry, implementing by decentralizing their production and having smaller batches of their goods, whether it's things that we put in our body or on our body, they all come from the same soil. There are also beehives on the site to create biodiversity. By attracting insects, they create a landscape that attracts insects and water dispenser for small birds. Farmers mow between the trees to eliminate weeds and plant cover crops to manage unwanted insects. So at Brightland, the pumice that the olive farm adds to the soil has nitrogen. And all of the benefits that come with planting other things beyond olives that said, some of the groves also have fava beans planted in between the olives, which are the best pairing for the olive trees. And here we have a beautiful drawing. And what works for the olive trees is very particular, but that can also work in cotton fields or when we are harvesting linen or harvesting other materials that are coming from the earth that end up on our backs. Brightland's farm partner is aiming to go off grid from an energy perspective and is aiming to be 100% solar powered by 2021, which is next year. So basically using waste as a new resource is how Brightland is seeing regenerative agriculture. And this is something that we wanna encourage the fashion industry to model their agricultural practices upon. Now we all know that some of the big brands in the fashion industry are completely disconnected from the farms or the land that harvests the cotton that they use or other materials that they use within their supply chain. But this is an invitation to go beyond this opacity and go straight into the heart of what makes fashion function, which is agriculture. 
Farms grow the olives without the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, or artificial agents. They use circular alternatives such as manure to fertilize the soil instead of, instead of turning pumice to waste. What Brightland does is twofold. They either compost it back into the farm or it's distributed to local ranches and used as cattle feed. And even the packaging of the bottles are 100% recyclable and plastic free. They can even be used as a way to, you know, as a vase, especially if you are going to buy the ones that we designed, we really hope you keep them. The top of this, the bottle is sugar cane bar, the top of it, and uh, it's a first zero carbon footprint tea cap closure. And so basically it's thought of in 360. So it's a very powerful way and a case study that we wanted to inspire the fashion industry to start looking at through this model applying climate positive solutions from food systems to fashion systems, from farming, regenerative farming, soil restoration, carbon farming, we're gonna look at that more in depth in the next slide, production, ethical, fair wage, regenerative export, working with a decentralized system with renewable energy and packaging, reusable, and of course, a take back model that we want the fashion industry to implement at scale. So as I was saying earlier, our atmosphere has too much carbon, an excess of 109 billion tons, while the soil around the world have too little. There's too little carbon in our soil. So carbon is not all bad, and you cannot just offset it by planting a tree because the soil itself needs the carbon. So there are so many innovations that capture the carbon from the atmosphere and releases it back into the soil. And that way they create a regenerative system and a way to design for survival, right? So it is a very powerful way into reintroducing carbon back into our soil and enriching our soil with that important carbon that is needed into our soil, not into the air. And again, Fiber Shed was one of our partner on this. We encourage you all to check them out. Uh, they have a body of work that's very expansive when it comes to carbon sequestration and what they call carbon farming. The implementation of practices that improve the rate at which the carbon is removed from the atmosphere and convert carbon into plant material and or soil organic matter, including pasture cropping, grassland restoration and applying composting to grazed rangeland. And now I'm a little bit early, but that's great because I don't want to run too late. We have our special guests. I don't know if Ariel, are you ready for this? And then team, can you push Ariel into, just let me introduce you very quickly. Great, okay. Uh, that's always so much better. Ariel Johnson is uh, like me, me, we met at MIT Media Lab as director's fellows, and this is her bio from the MIT website. <laughs> so Ariel Johnson is basically like a, a doctor flavor scientist, and of course you will say it better than me, but she tortures plants so that they can taste mm -hmm. better. <laughs> And she will let you know about it, but it's always so fun to introduce you in that way because the environment in which plants grow uh, is very much conductive to how they taste. And so the environment around them affects the way that the flavor is captured within the plant. So without saying anything else, I'll let you go and I'll, I'll change your slides. So just say, next, oh, okay. just Great. say next slide and I'll do it. Well, in, in some ways, going from the macro to the micro, um, my, I, I'm a chemist. Um, my formal training is in flavor chemistry. So um, I know chemistry was not everyone's favorite subject in school, but um, I think I found some cool and fun things to talk about with it. Uh, yeah, so, um, so we've been talking about olive oil. We've been talking about environment. And I'm just going to give a quick overview of how flavor relates to those two things. Okay, so this is me. Um, I, I did my PhD at UC Davis, um, actually in the same institute as the Olive Center where that, uh, that study you quoted was. I, I was in the Department of Viticulture and Enology, and my focus was on flavor chemistry and gastronomy. Uh, so I spent a lot of time counting molecules using uh, fancy equipment to, to do that and getting people to taste things and record 
flavors in very specific ways and then running statistical models to relate them. But my interest in gastronomy has brought me into the food industry a lot. I work a lot with restaurants on research and development. I was for a while at Noma as an R&D scientist. Uh, I co-founded the Noma Fermentation Lab. That's that um, funny shipping container uh, you can see in that photo. I am now uh, doing a lot of writing and education, helping people understand the science of cooking and the science of flavor, uh, including working on the Food Network show Good Eats, where I'm mostly behind the scenes, but sometimes they put me in front of the camera. But uh, yeah, I'm really into flavor and um, not just as a sensual experience, but understanding flavor as a kind of uh, marker and guidepost for understanding humans, our interactions with organisms and with the environment and um, as a design opportunity. So yes, I, I as a scientist, I think it's useful to always uh, define our terms. So when we talk about flavor, what are we actually talking about? So flavor, flavor, flavor is a basically a combination of taste and smell. Most people, when we talk about flavor, we say that something like tastes good or it tastes orangey. So taste is an important part of flavor. Taste technically happens with taste buds on the tongue. So the, the tastes that we have are sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Umami is sometimes less familiar to people um, because sweet, sour, salty, and bitter have been, you know, talked about since ancient times. Umami was only discovered about a hundred and a bit more years ago, but that is the, uh, the flavor of savoriness, the flavor of glutamates, the flavor of free amino acids. But any, any other kinds of, uh, of flavor complexity that you might be experiencing, roast flavors, cheesy flavors, coffee, anything sort of funky or green or almondy or toasty, those actually come from smell. So interestingly, that comes from not uh, sniffing things when they're in front of you, but your, your nose or rather your olfactory receptors in your nasal cavity are actually able to pick up on smell molecules while food is in your mouth. Um, they travel up the back of your throat. So most of, most of flavor variety comes from smell. Um, if you're thinking flavor, you should think smell. And uh, smell is complex and delicate, especially compared to taste. Here's where we get into chemistry. Um, taste, taste and smell, and, and therefore flavor, are what we call chemical senses. Um, everything we taste and smell comes from molecules. These are some of these flavor molecules. I've chosen some smell molecules. So if you like the, the clove taste in clove, that comes from eugenol. On the, on the right hand side, that's mostly like herbal, herbal flavors. Eugenol is clovey. Cineol is spicy. Eucalyptusy, that's the one of the main flavors in cardamom. On the right hand side, these are a lot of processing derived flavors. So um, most of those are made when you when you either heat up uh, grains or like toast bread or when you burn wood. So you get some of these uh, sweet, nutty and roasty flavors, some caramel, woody, and bready ones. You, you definitely don't have to memorize any of these. I, I mostly don't just because there's so many of them, but uh, like flavor comes from somewhere. Each of these molecules were made either deliberately by a plant or, or through some kind of processing that we're doing. So, so these, uh, these flavors come from somewhere. They come from something fairly concrete that we can attach things to. But you know, in food industry history, flavor chemistry has been a thing that we've known about for about 60 or 70 years. Um, a lot of it, the knowledge has been used to add flavor to things. So, um, you know, the flavoring of Coca-Cola or tortilla chips, uh, like Doritos. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of the, the fl flavor, the business of flavor has been about taking isolated flavor molecules and adding them to things. But another way to look at this is that we have all this knowledge about, um, even though a lot of it's buried uh, in technical journals, about where flavor comes from, what molecules create it. Um, and we know that all of those come from nature, either through biochemistry or chemical reactions. So, you know, we could use that to add flavor to things, but we can also use a little bit of know-how uh, about that to help us understand our interaction with those natural systems um, that they come from. So in the case of olive oil, let's, so just, just a little bit more chemistry. Um, so, you know, we know that, we know that olive oil has flavor. We like the kind of like grassy, peppery, uh, slightly fruity, all the, all the different sort of um, varietal characteristics of olive oil. So those are, so Celine, you talked a little bit about regenerative agriculture and how that works like natural metabolism. This is some 
metabolism in, in action. Uh, plants are super efficient. So any, any type of like extra molecules, like flavor that they make, they usually have a cool way of taking advantage of something else that they're making and just tweaking it a little bit to make flavor. So in this case, most of these olive flavor molecules, uh, the, two, the two smaller ones at the bottom actually come from the olive making like tons of fats and fats are pretty easy to uh, chemically transform with enzymes. Um, so they'll just like take a fat, which is this big sort of like three chained molecule, pop off one fatty acid, um, you know, which we like talk about in relation to health, et cetera, and then cut it up a little bit to make these flavor molecules that are grassy and fruity and herbal. Okay, so that, that was the, the how of uh, how, how olive oil makes flavor, but why, do olives, why would olives make flavor in the first place, um, besides just to be like nice to us? Uh, well, for the most part, um, it's actually in adaptation and response to their growing conditions. Uh, so, you know, plant, plants are quite efficient with their, with their metabolism and with where they allocate all of, the, all of the bits of chemistry that they make to grow their bodies and make baby plants and uh, energy, et cetera. Um, so the specific reason that most flavor molecules exist for the plant uh, is, is as a uh, environmental adaptation and for self-defense. And uh, understanding this helps us understand, in this case, olive plants and uh, work with them uh, better. When you think when you think flavor, especially aroma based flavor, flavor is adaptive. So if you're tasting grassy notes or spicy notes or sometimes the sort of like peppery uh, cough in the back of your throat that extra virgin olive oil can give you, you're tasting adaptation. Essentially, these are molecules that the plant uses to defend themselves. Uh, some of some of those adaptations are are cold stress. Uh, so. Olives grown during the winter uh, can have uh, more and different flavors than olives growing in a warmer season. Um, also, uh, defense against oxidation, leaf wounding from uh, leaf eating bugs, et cetera, from, from drought, drought stress, and uh, against fungi and molds. So one thing to bear in mind um, with a lot of these things is that these uh, things like leaf wounding, fungi and molds, and also like competition with other plants, um, which I didn't actually list. Those are things that happen more in a more biodiverse system. So, you know, this this kind of, this approach is still kind of in its infancy in chemistry, but um, there are like very, very strong indicators that plants that are like less coddled with, uh, with a lot of pesticides and without having to compete with any other plants um, tend to make fewer of these defensive compounds than uh, more, more biodiverse, more uh, stressed plants. You don't want to stress plants too much, but actually a little bit of stress is, is a reasonable. But big takeaway uh, on, the, on the next slide. So think of this, these are all, these are all conditions that um, the, the olive tree and the olive fruit grows up around. Uh, so essentially think of olive agriculture as making flavor. We, we do talk about terroir sometimes with wine. T terroir is real. You can, you can, there is a uh, tasteable evidence of how plants were cultivated and grew up and where they're from and what happened to them. Okay, so, so all of agriculture creates flavor. Flavor is not permanent. Molecules are almost constantly uh, able to be changed into other things, um, which can take away their, uh, their properties of flavor or create new ones. So, um, the agriculture creates flavor, but it's also possible to destroy flavor. Um, and knowing how this happens is, is useful for uh, preserving what you've done in the field. Um, so if we go to the next slide, th these, are, these are actual um, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer uh, analyses I measured about eight years ago of different, different olive oils. Um, we don't have to go super far into like, uh, uh, what each molecule is, but um, e each of these sort of blue triangle uh, peaks represents one molecule. And uh, the higher, the higher, and the wider each uh, each peak or triangle is, the more that there is of that of that molecule. So, this extra virgin olive oil was stored just at ambient. Um, it's got a lot of like green and apple-y molecules, some leafy and grassy ones, peppery, green, and fruity. So there's like there's stuff going on there. The same olive oil heated uh, to 190 Celsius, which is about 400 Fahrenheit. So like in a pan, essentially, for uh, 10 minutes, perhaps. Um, sufficient heating will actually evaporate those flavor molecules away. So the, the thing that makes flavor molecules 
smellable or, or flavorful is in part that they can actually travel to our noses. They, they spend some time as a gas. Uh, so if you heat them up, you can actually just like say bye bye to them. Interestingly, if you keep heating it, um, the same fats that the olive uses to create its special flavors enzymatically, if you apply enough heat to them, it's pretty easy to break them down into new flavor molecules. But uh, unfortunately, this process called thermal oxidation does not make the same flavor molecules as the olive does. It makes uh, much less nice ones, generally. Um, so uh, in, in heating up this olive oil, we, we actually go from a, or heating it up too much, um, we actually go from a pleasant, grassy, classic flavor profile to something with a lot of like woody and oily and like pungent and slightly rancid flavors. So um, they, all, they all come from the same fats, but how those fats are treated uh, determines what actual flavors you get. If you are not working in the field, which I imagine a lot of you are not, um, there are still like design and thinking opportunities uh, about about how to preserve some of this olive oil flavor that we've created through agriculture. One of them is actually agricultural. To keep those um, nice smell molecules, it's better to press the olive fruit sooner rather than later because um, you can have other other chemistry called lipolysis happening to the fats. But in the kitchen, the two things you want to uh, avoid are photo oxidation. Um, light can actually break these molecules apart in, the, in a similar way as heat and avoid, again, heat, uh, avoid thermal oxidation. So um, opaque bottles and uh, cool storage are both good on a molecular level for uh, preserving the flavor of these molecules. Devon, I'm not gonna yeah. read your bio. Oh my god, do not read it. It's yes, so lengthy. Really, I can sum it up. But uh, yes, you, you're welcome to sum it up. I just fell in love with the way that you present food and you work at the intersection of food and fashion. And I feel it was like a perfect conclusion for this class. Of course, we looked at it from such a broad lens. And as Ariel said, we're zooming out, zooming in constantly in our understanding. And I will leave it to you to talk about this way that you use food as a cultural movement in a way and how that you bridge all of, you connect the dots so well and I'm, I'm going to leave it to you to tell us about that. Yeah so my name is Devon Francis. I am a chef and artist and founder of Yardy World, a company that I started about two and a half years ago. Uh, and Yardy World when I first started it was kind of my attempt and desire to see uh, something beyond the you know classic and traditional restaurant space happen. So um, on, the, on the face of it, it was sort of hosting pop-up dinners, doing a lot of kind of supper club type things, uh, and kind of really getting an understanding of what kind of space as a queer first-generation Jamaican-American person I wanted to take up when it came to the food industry. And thinking about that from not only a food perspective, but also thinking about it from, the pro from proximity of what it means to create your own narratives and kind of have agency and authority to make the things that you want to make and kind of talk about culture from your perspective. And so for me, what started out as just kind of using these supper clubs and dinners as a way to engage my own community and thinking about what, what safe space meant for the food industry, which is, you know, highly political, um, sometimes highly, highly racist, um, highly, you know, anti anti-gay, anti-queer, um, and a lot of violence that is enacted in terms of not only the, the food space, but also the agricultural space. So how do we, you know, think about the ways that bodies are are used or, you know, the abuse that happens sometimes in those spaces and, and trying to tease out the details of what it would mean to, to fashion a world or a space that looked different than that. I should go back to say that Yardi, um, the word Yardi comes from uh, the, the Jamaican Patois Yardi, which essentially is kind of a, a hearkening back to this idea of home, this idea that when you say Yardi to someone who is Jamaican, you know, you're identifying them as, as someone who's from the same place as you. Um, and that's really important because the whole kind of ethos of our company is thinking about what it means to signal that you know, the food space and the event space and, and the hospitality space should be a place where you prior, prioritize this idea of home versus something that's, you know, typically very institutionalized, right? Like we have all these kind of like French techniques of cooking cuisine that is kind of 
prioritized over things that we call, you know, street food or ethnic food. And the question to me as someone who's a chef and artist is why is that? Why does that happen? Who gets to, um, who, who is in control of those narratives and, and why that is? So when we started out the company, as I was saying, it was really me sort of trying to figure out how to uncover this, a lot of ideas around ingredients and proximity and sourcing when it comes to Jamaican and Caribbean cuisine. Um, and also thinking about what it actually means to have, like, what is the, the, what does the immigrant experience mean today, right now to me in, in my you know, specific context. And so food has always been kind of like a lens to have those conversations, both, you know, with, within the events that we do, but also thinking about how that can extend to our community and also the clients that we reach out to. Um, when we do events, we're thinking about not only the dinner table, but how do you actually craft an experience that can engage with people in a way that's not so cut and dry? How do you actually allow people to understand that they're not just observers when it comes to eating, right? We're not just looking at things, we're not just consuming, but we're also participating in how culture is made and how we're, how we're constantly defining and reifying culture in ways that can sometimes be harmful to other people who maybe have, you know, we don't share the same proximity with, or maybe there's a different socioeconomic structure that underlies, you know, how, how food ways and food histories have come to be. And it's interesting because I think, you know, talking about Brightland, talking about this olive oil and talking about fashion for me is, is really important because it is really like a question of like labor visibility and, and the economics of the supply chain, um, how different people are kind of obviously like there are, there are different sort of like, I guess, frictions and fissures and how we can understand how something is made and how something like how something maybe is harmful and, and why that is. And so we kind of use a combination of food, but also the aesthetics around design and, and fashion to tell those stories. And this is a great slide to look at because a little bit of history about the company as well. When we started Yardy Rolled in 2017, in the fall of 2017, it was because I was actually looking through an archive of film photography that was around the time when my parents who came to America when they were 13 and 14, you know, they were taking all these photos. My, my mother's mother was a, was a seamstress. Um, and so she was making all of these clothing for her, 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 her daughters and her sons, also sewing wedding dresses for women in Brooklyn. And so they would always do these photo shoots. And I was obsessed with this idea that, you know, you weren't like the idea of making an image from start to finish was made specifically around the, the black immigrant experience and thinking specifically about what it meant to not only vouch for visibility, but also having agency to make make images as well. Um, and so this image that is on the left side is a recreation of one of the film uh, photographs that we took of my mother. We did this photo, I think maybe it was last, last winter we did this photo with her. Um, and the idea was that, you know, every year we would have a new photo that kind of harkened back to this idea of what it meant to show show age, show this idea of like generational knowledge and, and, and generational wealth, what it meant to actually um, create or add back into that archive from a food perspective, but also from a visual perspective as well. Um, and I think fashion is one of those things, just like food, that's so important to our experience because it really is about being able to define the ways that you move around. Like, you know, Ar Ariel just used the word terroir as this kind of like signal of an experience. Um, and I think that's kind of perfect because it really talks about um, how you kind of relate to, to someone or a place based on your context and based on the context of how an image is made or how, it, or how like say a plate of food is made, right? And so it's really important for us that we are also the author of our own imagery and, and building a brand for me is not just about the aesthetics or making something that like is high fashion or speaks to like you know, a very classic traditional historic experience, but also understanding that chefs and artists and anyone who makes are very much so stewards of, of a cultural experience and, and are adding to are adding to or continuing on to a legacy. Um, and that's really important when we think about the, the sort of politics of, of food and the supply chain, because it is a question of land, how things are grown, why things are grown, how things are priced. And I think that the event space has been a really interesting testing ground for us because we're, you know, we're not just thinking about um, making things that are delicious, which is obviously very important, but we're also thinking about what equity means in terms of being able to take up space um, and being able to vouch for, you know, farmers who are growing 
okra or ackee in in the West Indies um, and how to also empower them, you know, or, you know, lend support to them in ways that feel good. Um, and this is interesting, too, because a lot of the research that we're doing when it comes to, to you know, making space and, and vouching for um, the immigrant or queer or Black experience um, comes from a lot of research that we're doing about um, Southern foodways. I'm also from Virginia. And that's important, too, because when you think about a lot of uh, what was happening around like forced migration um, from the South to places like, you know, Detroit, Chicago, um, we're talking about uh, a lot of a lot of farming practices around that time um, when it came to Black communities that were kind of trying to, you know, rebuild and kind of insert themselves into this narrative, um, you know, post slavery uh, are essentially finding new ways to do work and kind of combat the pressures of um, not necessarily having a stake in the land or having a stake in what they could grow, but also but banding together to kind of um, uphold and, and, and uplift their own experiences and their own food ways based on the resources that they had presently. Um, and so that's, that's really important to our work because we're trying to figure out, you know, right now in this context um, where, you know, like globally, food is shifting all the time and language around food and, and around bodies, you know, actually is shifting all the time. How are we adding to that narrative in a way that is generative for everyone who wants to be involved in that experience, um, but also thinking about it, not just from a standpoint of, you know, we're making money off of what we do, but also building in equity into, into the model of, of, our, of our business as well, which is not by, by no means an easy thing. Um, but, you know, I think that the fact that we have these conversations front of mind, labor, identity, uh, economics, race, and the politics around all those things, when it comes to food in the fashion space, it creates a really interesting and I think important model for us to just learn from what we're doing. And also, as I was saying before, add to that archive so that, you know, if there is some black queer person in, in Jamaica who, are, who is looking for a template for what to do and how to navigate this experience, we hope to be that thing. We hope to provide those resources and tools through our program and through our project that we do. You tied it so well between this idea of identity to the idea of agriculture and the land and access to the land and as you said with the forced migration to the north there was this this loss of land essentially and this you know people were forced to find new ways into how do we uh, continue to have food sovereignty without the land necessarily and like new ways of planting and and uh, taking care of their food um and again i said very quickly in my class uh, earlier that when we talk about, you know, the food industry being ahead of the fashion industry when it comes to organic practices or regenerative agriculture, or at least this type of awareness that's being imposed on the food industry, we also have to talk about access to food and food security that isn't even something that's applicable in the United States, let alone in the rest of the world. But do you have something to say about that? I was like, is that for oh, Ariel? Yeah, let's, let's open it up. To, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can like look at each other because it's the end of the class. And now we can all chime in and look at the, at the questions that we've received. This was so amazing. Um, I have, I guess one question is someone asked, how was the journey with starting Yardi? I can answer that pretty quick. Um, starting Yardi was really challenging. Um, I mean, because, you know, it's, I mean, it's interesting how right now the pandemic is kind of revealing, it's kind of like drawing back the curtains on a lot of things that I think that people don't realize about uh, the, right, the restaurant and dining industry or the hospitality industry, which is like maybe, I mean, or maybe it's just new to me that like everything's based on like uh, capital and real estate. <laughs> so, so, for, so for me, it was really difficult because, you know, this is the idea of just like what maybe like cooperative economics as a model, which is maybe be, you know better for what it means to build something collectively with people that you kind of want to be in conversation with. So, so for me, I've, I've been building the company pretty much by myself, obviously with a lot of guidance from from friends, and I have a really incredible network of people who have given me advice. But really, the question is just like, how do you actually, you know, change something that is that was at first supposed to be just kind of like a niche product to explore my own identity, then kind of grow that into a model in a way that is, you know. Has, has a positive impact that actually maybe can help us think through buying power, buying power and what it means to actually have buying powder as some as people who are like, you know, feeding X amount of people a day. Um, and so for me with starting Yardi, I mean, like one of the most important things for me was just to kind of like tap into, again, that idea of the archive, right? Like 
a lot of the things that I'm kind of researching and looking at now, you know, three years ago or five years ago, when I'm thinking about it, I couldn't actually, it wasn't, it wasn't available in writing. I had to kind of like create my own archive by doing recordings of my grandmother, or recordings of my aunts and uncles, um, going to Jamaica for the first time as an adult uh, a year and a half ago and speaking to my family, looking at the neighborhoods and, and actually doing my own kind of like geographical assessments of, of like what is like what's happening, what's actually like trying to, to make sense of this historic landscape that isn't recorded in ways that are so accessible all the time. And I and that kind of answers, I think, someone else's question, um, too, of like, how do you, I forgot where it was, but I kind of, I kind of interpreted the, the question as like, like, how do you engage with your work on a historic or like a, a way that speaks to your own kind of background and your own, like, family, your own history. Um, and for me, it's like, and, and I think they were a chef and they were saying that, how do you put your own twist on it with, you know, well, maybe like respecting those traditions. And for me, it really does start with the the, the history of it and, and what is written down as a recipe and thinking about what the classics are and also thinking about why the classics are the way they are. The one thing about the work that I do, and this is something I say, you know, whenever someone asks me like, you know, are, are we making Jamaican food? Is well, it's like, well, what is Jamaican food and what does that actually mean? And how do you also think about that when, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not living in Jamaica and I'm also not living in, the, in Jamaica like, pre-independence right so like those are these are like a lot of different facets of like what it means to think about how the supply chain has changed and continues to change based on like Jamaica's independence or thinking about the fact that my context right now is that I'm a you know person living in New York there's a very specific access to ingredients that we have how do you think through that in a way that still speaks to the things that you care about the flavor profiles um the, the way that dishes are formulated and making it something that you believe in um, and really food is about experimentation. I think recipes are templates. So I think that do like being doing your due diligence and like thinking about how history works is important. Um, but also knowing that like things are things are malleable within reason. I don't know if that kind of answers the question. <laughs> That's amazing. So many am amazing questions for both of you. I'm so excited. Someone is asking you, Devon, if you have internship programs. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah so, so we cool. oh wow yeah so we have a, a volunteer program where we do a lot of um cooking at the, our current location um we're, we're doing grocery free grocery meal program for families in brooklyn um and so anyone who wants to engage with us can go through that program too uh we do saturday packing and cooking like meal prep for these families um but also you can send us an email um community at yardy.nyc and let us know what you're thinking about, what your interests are. Actually, I see one from uh, Diana El Ricciani um, at, at 1.13 p.m. Uh, I wonder how taste, especially that of North American and European who have mass consumer power, can affect the original taste of the land it is produced from to better suit the market. Can heritage taste, if that's a thing, be erased and forgotten? The next one under that is asking about if there's a native flavor archive somewhere, um, wow. which, are very, which are very related questions. Um, I mean, you know, the, 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 the specter of capitalism um, kind of looms large over many of the things that all of us are talking about um, as kind of a uh, like driving and often flattening force. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, like the, the, the history of plant breeding uh, in the in the twentieth and going into the twenty first century has often really been about um, you know using using basic knowledge of uh, plant biochemistry to uh, breed high yielding very uniform things um, with a lot of loss of flavor. But the thing about the thing about cuisine and and agriculture is that they're they're like they're living things. I mean, literally, agriculture is living plants, but like they are like living interactions with between like people and plants and the land. Um, so yeah, no, there are, there are actually some cool projects that, that are working on trying to like keep some of these flavors, but flavors as expressed through, through plants around the indigenous food lab in uh, Minneapolis and, uh, Natifs both do a lot of interesting stuff with that, especially through cooking. Um, I mean, I, I tend to think that cook, cooking things helps preserve them um as a tradition because if you're if you there's flavors and practices that have been lost um not lost but not necessarily lost or suppressed um that that actually just just doing them helps uh 
spread them and create demand uh, and knowledge for them. Um, so they're doing really interesting stuff. Uh, two, two of those chefs are uh, Sean Sherman and um, Brian Yazzie. And I know they've also collaborated with the Culinary Breeding Network. Uh, so that's actually a project out of uh, Oregon State University where they work with academic plant breeders, but also chefs and farmers um, to try to breed seeds that are both like appropriate for uh, certain landscapes, but also express a lot of flavor um, and not, not try to do this flattening. So um, yeah, there is, uh, there, there are definitely people working at, both from the, from the cooking side, the kind of um, enacting uh, the, the, the living of this, uh, of both flavor and plant biochemistry, as well as people um, working more on the academic side. Thank you so much. I'm answering here a question by Claudia Lee. What are the thoughts on keeping costs low while also supporting regenerative agriculture practices, which I assume will be expensive because it requires restructuring, readaptation, conventional practices? Do you guys have an answer? And I'm also typing uh, some, some of my thoughts in the, in the, in the Q&A. But uh, in general, you know, of course, if you are working with a farm, with, with a farm, with, with a, um, a partner, it's, it, the cost should be shared because this idea of regeneration should come from also the farm that you are working with. And if the farm needs a complete restructuring, maybe it's more economic and smarter to find a, a partner that really meets your, your vision and your values. And so that's where this idea with Brightland is very much a partnership with the farm. And in fashion, we've seen so many other models that partner with the farms and help them restructure their farms on the long run. So it's good to have a big, bold goal, but it's great to work incrementally towards that goal by encouraging you know, other brands to follow through as well. Thank you so much again, Ariel and Devon. It, you made it so much better for everyone. <laughs> I love geeking up on the chemistry. I really sucked at chemistry in school, so this was great. Someone said I would redo my chemistry classes if Dr. <laughs> Ariel was my teacher. <laughs> and thank you so much for everybody. Uh, I really see that there is a bridge between fashion and food because first it's on the same soil. And, uh, and any last thoughts that you guys want to share, feel free to share them. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for having um, us. And I, I mean, this is this has been so educational and, and fab for me. I wish I we can do this for another hour, honestly. No, I mean, th thanks so much for thanks so much for having me and for everyone s sitting through my chemistry ramblings. But it, no, I mean, I think it's really you know great that people are interested. But I, also, like, it's always such a pleasure to be able to chat with you, Celine and me Devon. Too. I love what you guys are doing, both of you. Just so like heartening and impressive um, to, to see the, the good things that you're actually creating in the world. Thank yeah. you. This was so wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>